Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net, where I teach beginners the skills that they need to get their first software development job building Windows and web apps at the world's best companies as quickly as possible. So congratulations, you did it. You made it all the way to the end. You know, when I look at the, uh, the views for a given video series, I'll typically see the first two or three videos are, are heavily watched and then it dramatically drops off from there. Maybe it's me, I don't know. But I, I think what's going on is that people have every intent to follow through and to watch an entire series and then something distracts them. But that's not you. You made it all the way to the end. And now you're well on your way to mastering C Sharp or at least learning more about C Sharp from here, learning more about .NET, picking a, a user interface technology, learning more about databases and how to access them using .NET APIs and more. And so you'll be building your own applications, whether for yourself or for another company. Uh, but whatever the case might be, congratulations. Keep pushing forward. Baby steps on a daily basis is how you make real improvement and uh, add to your skill set. But you've, you've taken a great step in the right direction. All right, so in this lesson, I want to wrap up the series and provide a few suggestions about where to look for answers for your questions and the issues that will inevitably pop up as you work at learning more and more about .NET from this point on. We're also going to talk about the right way and the wrong way to ask for help on the Internet and a few suggestions on key topics that you should be focusing on next in your self-directed training. So first of all, let me say that some of the, these ideas, especially the more advanced concepts that I hinted at or discussed briefly, they could take weeks or months in order to really digest. So just staring at the wall and thinking about them for a while. Uh, honestly, there are things that uh, I learned maybe 10 years ago that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But it's important that you keep pushing forward and you keep learning and, and many times I might need to read what many different blogs or books or videos have to say about a topic before it finally resonates me and I really understand what I need to do or how to apply that. Um, each person who talks or writes about a given topic can say things just a little bit differently and somehow that helps, sometimes that helps me cement some of these ideas in place or clarify these ideas. Uh, and this is important. You don't need to know everything right up front in order to be productive. And some concepts, for example, the need for object-oriented programming, they're only going to become more obvious after you have more experience, after you've made some mistakes, and so on. So I hope you kept in mind that the intent of this series was to supply this information as a means of explaining the code examples that you might see in articles online or in books or to provide some insights to help you understand how the .NET Framework class library is structured and how it operates. So where do you go from here? Well let me address that in two ways. First of all, where do you go from here whenever you have a problem? Well chances are that at some point as you're learning and you're building applications you're going to run into error message that you just can't make sense of. It happens to everyone, don't fret. In fact, I think a big part of what makes programming a valuable skill is the experience that you gain from working through all the various problems and issues that will inevitably bump up and that you'll run into. So the good news is that there is a large community of other developers inside and outside of Microsoft that can help nudge you past these sorts of problems. In my experience, there's just a few issues that beginners run into. The first is configuration or installation or some permissions issue on their computer. This could be a strange error that happens in Visual Studio whenever attempting to load a project or compile a project or debug a project. Uh, when I hit an error that I've never seen before, I take four steps. I guess I haven't written these out until now, uh, but these are the four things that I, I basically do. First of all, I research using the key phrase from the error message. Uh, and, and that's vitally important. Any error numbers or exact phrases surrounded in quotes in your favorite search engine will get you closer to a resolution. I might spend 10 to 15 minutes scanning through various blogs, uh, forums, or on MSDN to find a potential solution. And if I'm mindful about my search terms, I almost always find a solution. And I think that a lot of beginners fail with finding solutions to their problems because they become impatient with the error messages or they don't quite know how to search correctly. Using the exact 
phrase inside the error messages that you see on screen surrounded but with double quotes will get you closer to finding uh, other people that have had similar issues that have posted how they were able to resolve those issues. So research. Second thing you need to do, reboot. <laughs> Before I go and do something potentially destructive or time consuming, and I'm convinced this is an issue with Visual Studio and not my code, then I'm going to shut down Visual Studio and see if that resolves the problem when I reboot it. If that doesn't fix the problem, then I reboot the entire computer and see if that resolves the problem. And if that doesn't fix the problem, then I attempt to uninstall Visual Studio and reinstall it. Now let me caution you right there. I almost never have to do this. It's been years since I've had to do this. You should not start with uninstalling and reinstalling Visual Studio, but it is an option. And then the final option, the nuclear option, is to completely reset the computer. It, reinstall the operating system, then reinstall Visual Studio, everything. Uh, again, I call this the nuclear option because you'll spend hours going through this exercise. Again, it's been years since I've had to do anything quite that drastic, but it is an option. But when I've had to do it, it's been so painful that I've become very regimented with how I work with my computer. I generally try to keep the computer that I use for work, uh, that I use for work with, with Visual Studio, pristine. In fact, I keep the computer that I surf the internet with or play games on a separate computer than I use with Visual Studio. It's not a matter of Visual Studio being temperamental or anything like that. It's just that there's a lot of resources that Visual Studio is counting on to be unadulterated. All right, So I try to keep that machine updated with new operating system updates, using Windows Update, and so on. So short of something wrong with my operating system or wrong with Visual Studio, most of the issues that I run into or I've seen beginners experience involve one of several broad categories of problems. Uh, for example, unexpected order of events firing. Remember, we talked about that in the last video. So in a simple application, this might not seem like much of an issue. However, as you'll probably learn whenever you focus on a single presentation technology like Windows Presentation Foundation or ASP.NET, there are many events and they're potentially fired uh, in an order that might seem innocuous uh, like the form load or the button click, but the solution to these sorts of issues that pop up is to usually to set a breakpoint in multiple places in your code to better understand what is happening first, then what's happening second, then what's happening third, um, to identify how uh, code that's handling two events are battling each other, how they're fighting each other, perhaps on who displays the data on screen and, and other uh, uh, how they're clearing data from the screen. So this happens to beginners more than you might first imagine. Often that conflict between two events that are firing at the same time and you don't expect an event to fire, for example. All right, uh, another thing is uh, connecting to outside resources like opening up a file or connecting to a database or connecting to a web service or a website. It presents challenges to those who are just getting started. Again, reading the error messages closely and doing some research on uh, the internet for the exact terms that you see in the error message is the key to determining what's to blame for the problem or the issue. So beware, if you copy a code example from an article or a book, you may have to modify the example slightly, taking into account the connection information based on where a resource is on your hard drive or on the network. Sometimes Users copy entire examples and they just paste it in there and think this will work and then doesn't work and like I have no idea what this does and they start asking around and the, the solution is simple. They just didn't modify it to change the connection information to whatever resource it is they're trying to connect to on their own system or network. Okay, So another common issue that beginners run into is using the wrong tool for the job. Uh, shoehorning a technology uh, that you're already familiar with into a situation where it really doesn't fit in lieu of learning a better technology that's well suited for the task at hand. So this might be because you have a fundamental misunderstanding of the technology and what it was designed to do uh, and understanding its limitations as well as understanding what other good options are available for you. So what I recommend here is to continue reading books continue reading articles, 
learning new techniques, learning new technologies. I have a very large collection of books. This isn't even the uh, half of them. I mean, there's a, it's a four by four cube here and I've got several bookcases downstairs in my other office. And I haven't read every single one of these books from cover to cover. Instead, what I do is I'll, I'll buy a new book and uh, the first thing that I do is I spend about 10 to 15 minutes just looking closely at the table of contents and then I flip through just about every page uh, and make a mental bookmark for the types of content that's covered in a given book. When I need to make a decision in the future, I start narrowing down the books I reference for more guidance on a topic that I'm not familiar with. Now, you could do the same thing with blogs and articles online. I subscribe to about 100 blogs and I use a service online that sends me updates from the blog via email since, for me, I check my email every day, so I'm going to see all those blog posts come in through my email. So the first thing I do is I scan through the blog posts, and if it's relevant to something I think I might need in the future, I archive it. All right. In all of these cases, I'm building a library of resources and an overall framework that new and existing technologies can fit into. And I make mental notes and I have a mental map of where these technologies fit. All right. So when I need to utilize that given technology in an application, then I dig deeper and I become an instant expert. All right. Uh, there are a few geniuses out there that have photographic memories, but for the rest of us, we simply have to be organized and we have to have a good general knowledge of a lot of areas and then dive in deep whenever we need to. So I think one vital skill as a modern software developer is to become great at searching on the internet to help solve issues that you run into. It might, ask, it might sound easier to uh, ask a question about a problem that you're having, but I assure you it'll actually take longer to ask the question and get an answer than just searching, refining your searches, and so on until you find the solution to your problem. Uh, I almost never, never have to ask a question in forums because a simple search will almost always yield a clue as to what I did wrong or what the issue is. All right. Keep in mind, there are literally millions of people in the world that are working in the .NET framework on a full-time basis every day of their lives. And this means that there's this massive body of knowledge out there that you can tap into whenever you need it. Virtually any issue that you run into, I guarantee somebody else has already experienced that problem and they found a solution for it and they've already posted that solution online. You just need to go out and find it. And if you can get good at that, finding solutions to your problems then it'll help get you back on your way faster, all right? But let's suppose that you're at your wit's end and you've patiently worked through search results and, and nothing you've tried actually works to resolve your problem. Well, maybe at that point you need to ask for help. Here's what you need to do to get a resolution. First of all, you need to be an empathetic requester. In other words, give people who are willing to help you enough information so that they can pinpoint the issue. This means that you need to clearly state your request. And so here's a checklist of the things that you should include in your post. You should start by posting your question in the right place. Find the right category in uh, the given forum or the right blog post to, to post into. Posting a C-sharp question in a Visual Basic forum is not going to be all that productive. Also, you need to choose a simple, clear title for your post so that it attracts attention of the people who can help and it saves everybody a lot of time. If I see a forum post that says, please help, I skip it. If it says, link to objects query yielding unexpected results, all right, well, I might be able to help with that. I'll read the question and I'll chime in if I think I can help. All right, a short synopsis of the issue you're having, including the exact error message or the behavior that you're experiencing. Describe what you expected to happen and what happened instead. And also, if you can, include a screenshot if possible. Ideally, if you use an image editing program, draw a box <laughs> to around the part of the screenshot that you want to call everybody's attention to. Include a code example. Change up any super secret information before you post the example if you have to, but without a code snippet, many problems are unsolvable. I can't tell you how many times I get people writing me emails or I see online, I'm having a problem with this. What do you think the solution is? And I'm like, well, 
show me some code, man. <laughs> okay? I got to see what you've written before I can help solve your problem. So include a code snippet of the code that you think is causing this problem. And then be choosy about which code to post. Nothing's more frustrating that looking at, than looking at somebody who posts 200 lines of code. You really need to help me. Identify those lines of code that might be involved in the issue. If a given form has special HTML tags that, or short codes that you can use to format the code to help it stand out in the post, you should use it. So tell me, what did you try so far to help solve the problem? And what, and did it help at all? Did it change anything? Did this lead you to rule out several possibilities? Again, empathize with the reader. This will result in a faster resolution. Otherwise, people will start with the obvious issues and move forward. You know, there's the old joke about, hey, I'm having a problem with my computer, and the technician asks, do you have it plugged in, all right? There's a reason why it's because the most obvious answer is the one that uh, most of the time works for people. And so don't be that guy, <laughs> okay? Tell me what you've already tried and what you've ruled out as a possibility. All right, tell me which operating system you're using, which version of Visual Studio, which programming language you're using, which updates or service packs have been applied. This matters more than you might realize. Uh, also, suppose there's a resolution to the issue. One of the suggestions that somebody made was helpful, and it got you pointed in the right direction. That's awesome. So take a moment, go back, describe exactly what you did to resolve the issue step by step as a means of helping others in the future and as a means of articulating for your own future understanding exactly what the issue was and what that meant. Chances are that you're going to experience a similar issue in the future, and it would be nice just to search for your own solution online if you knew where it was, all right? And finally, be polite. People don't owe you an answer, all right? They're going to be helping you in their spare time and as a means of furthering their own understanding. So say please, say thank you, be nice, right? All right, so you might be wondering where to go and ask your questions. That really depends. I recommend that you start here on msdn.microsoft.com slash forums. That forum is monitored by Microsoft employees uh, and people called Microsoft Valuable Professionals or Microsoft Most Valuable Professionals. I think it's just Microsoft Valuable Professionals. Knowledgeable people who've demonstrated their willingness to help and they've been identified by Microsoft as people who are willing to help. And so they qualify for that based on several criteria, but not the least of which is their participation in those forums. So there's also a more comprehensive uh, place to go, and it's called Stack Exchange. Now, in my experience, it's a little less beginner friendly. Uh, maybe it'll be changed by the time you get there, but it's at programmers.stackexchange.com. Uh, I only say that it's less friendly because you will be critiqued for how you ask your question. Just follow their rules. Search first before you ask a duplicate question and don't take offense to the criticism about your question. Uh, I'd recommend you search long and hard before asking a question. Virtually everything you can imagine has been asked by somebody already. You just need to spend time finding the answer. So I said I would answer the question where to go from here in two ways. And I've answered the question about where to go when you have problems. But now I'm going to answer where to go to learn more about application development, software development. All right, so now you have a basic knowledge of the C-sharp programming language. You're not done here. There's still a lot of practice and opportunity to grow. Uh, but now you should have a solid base to build on, right? So no matter what type of applications that you want to build, there are a few other fundamental ideas that you really need to become acquainted with. First of all, you need to lear learn how to work with relational databases like SQL Server. You should learn how to access data that's stored in a database using either ADO.NET or the new Entity Framework. Both have visual tools that you can start with to drag and drop and configure your settings and selections. You'll want to quickly grow past that and learn how to write code and, and rely less on the visual designers in Visual Studio, but it's still a great place to start. Next, you're going to need to choose a presentation technology to master. You have no lack of options in this area, including ASP.NET Web Forms 
ASP.NET MVC, which stands for Model View Controller. It's a little more popular now, but a little bit more difficult, in my opinion, for beginners to grasp. There's Windows Forms, there's Windows Presentation Foundation, uh, there's Windows Store apps, um, uh, and, and so on. Now, if you're not sure, let me suggest that at the very least, you should learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I've created several fundamental series on Microsoft's Channel 9 that are aimed at each of these topics. Then I recommend learning the basic tenets of application architecture, particularly splitting your code base into layers of responsibility. Splitting your code into layers of responsibility will help you build applications that can withstand the impact of change. Change comes from changing business requirements, it comes from changes in technology, it comes from defects in the software, and so on. In each case, you can mitigate the impact of making changes in your code by encapsulating the responsibilities behind well-established APIs. I spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about application architecture on my own website, again, www.learnvisualstudio.net. But from there, you're gonna to wanna to learn about basic software design patterns, tactics, and techniques. And there are a few keywords that you'll wanna learn about. Each of these could spawn an entire book or video series. And I've already alluded to object-oriented programming. That's a biggie. If you could just get your mind wrapped around that first, that's a huge step in the right direction. But beyond that, you're going to want to learn about principles, about principles that guide you in the way that you go about writing your code. Things like dry, don't repeat yourself. I think I've already alluded to that one, even though I didn't give it a name a little bit earlier. There's also one called YAGNI which is, you ain't gonna need it, all right? Uh, there's something called dependency injection, which is a pattern that guides you towards building loosely coupled objects that can be swapped out. And you'll wanna learn why that matters. And then there's a set of principles called solid, which are a set of five principles that help you realize the promise of object-oriented programming in your applications. And there are also grasp patterns, a set of principles that help you assign responsibilities to objects in your applications. All right, and the list could be a mile long, but you'll wanna learn some basic principles that will guide you about where should I write this code? Where should the responsibility for this business rule or this action be put in my code? All right, and so there are some, there's a lot of thought given to that. You're going to want to learn about workflow. Specifically, you're going to want to learn about working in teams and sharing code and using a source code repository. You'll definitely want to learn about building unit tests, tiny code-based tests that continually test your code. Some have even gone to, as far as to suggest that you should be writing those tests first to drive the development of your production code in a process that's called test-driven development. You'll want to learn about agile project management and agile software development techniques, uh, defining requirements in user stories, playing planning poker, uh, using agile boards to manage assigned tasks between uh, uh, software developers. Um, you'll want to learn about the nature of iterative development. You'll want to learn about developing a spike of functionality and much more. So there's the path. I've given you probably about six dozen keywords there for you to search on. It'll take you the next several years to learn it all. But fortunately, again, you don't have to know it all to get started. But yes, so much to learn, so little time. Uh, I've even gotten friends at Microsoft to confide in me that it's a challenge for them too, all right? So nobody just knows all this stuff automatically and it keeps evolving. But this is what makes software development so fun and challenging, but also a little daunting. Uh, there's a bunch of resources out on the internet, not the least of which is Channel 9 and MSDN, uh, and uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy is a great place to learn as well. However, let me make one final plug for my own website, www.learnvisualstudio.net, which at the time I record this has about 150 hours of training that's geared towards somebody who is a beginner, uh, helping them get up and running as fast as possible, pointing out what I feel like are the key ideas that you need to master, including homework exercises, uh, interaction with me via Q&A about each video and more. So please check it out when you have a chance. Okay, so as I close, I hope you found this course to be valuable. If there's anything that I can do to help you, please let me know. As I said at the outset, you can post a question on the comments associated with a given video, or you can write me at bob at learnvisualstudio.net. 
but I wish you great success in your career. Good luck, and thank you for watching.